Section 15 of Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded, by Samuel Richardson. Section 15 About two hours after, which was near eleven o'clock, Mrs. Jukes and I went up to bed. I was pleasing myself with what a charming night I should have. We locked both doors, and saw poor Nan, as I thought. But, oh, it was my abominable master, as you shall hear by and by, sitting fast asleep in an elbow-chair in a dark corner of the room, with her apron thrown over her head and neck. And Mrs. Jukes said, There's that beast of a wench fast asleep instead of being abed. I knew, she said, she had taken a fine dose. I'll wake her, said I. No, don't, said she. Let her sleep on. We shall be better without her. Ay, said I, so we shall. But won't she get cold? Said she, I hope you have no writing to-night. No, replied I. I will go to bed with you, Mrs. Jukes. Said she, I wonder what you can find to write about so much. And I am sure you have better conveniences of that kind, and more paper than I am aware of, and I had intended to rummage you if my master had not come down, for I spied a broken teacup with ink which gave me suspicion. But as he has come, let him look after you if he will, and if you deceive him, it will be his own fault. All this time we were undressing ourselves, and I fetched a deep sigh. What do you sigh for? said she. I am thinking, Mrs. Jukes, answered I, what a sad life I live, and how hard is my lot. I am sure the thief that has robbed is much better off than I, baiting the guilt, and I should, I think, take it for a mercy to be hanged out of the way, rather than to live in these cruel apprehensions. So, being not sleepy and in a prattling vein, I began to give a little history of myself, as I did once before to Mrs. Jarvis in this manner. Here, said I, were my poor honest parents. They took care to install good principles into my mind until I was almost twelve years of age, and taught me to prefer goodness and poverty to the highest condition of life, and they confirmed their lessons by their own practice, for they were of late years remarkably poor and always as remarkably honest, even to a proverb. For as honest as Goodman Andrews was a byword. Well then, said I, comes my late dear good lady, and takes a fancy to me, and said she would be the making of me if I was a good girl, and she put me to sing, to dance, to play on the spinet, in order to divert her melancholy hours, and also taught me all manner of fine needlework, but still this was her lesson. My good Pamela, be virtuous, and keep the men at a distance. Well, so I was, I hope, and so I did. And yet, though I say it, they all loved me and respected me, and would do anything for me, as if I were a gentlewoman. But then, what comes next? Why, it pleased God to take my good lady, and then comes my master. And what, says he? Why, in effect, it is, be not virtuous, Pamela. So here I have lived about sixteen years in virtue and reputation, and all at once, when I come to know what is good and what is evil, I must renounce all the good, all the whole sixteen years innocent, which next to God's grace I owed chiefly to my parents, and my lady's good lessons and examples, and choose the evil, and so in a moment's time become the vilest of creatures, and all this for what, I pray? Why, truly, for a pair of diamond earrings, a necklace, and a diamond ring for my finger, which would not become me. For a few paltry fine clothes, which when I wore them would make but my former poverty more ridiculous to everybody that saw me, especially when they knew the base terms I wore them upon. But indeed I was to have such a great parcel of guineas beside, I forget how many, for had there been ten times more, they would have not been so much to me as the honest six guineas you tricked me out of, Mrs. Jukes. Well, forsooth, but then I was to have I know not how many pounds a year for my life, 
and my poor father, he was the jest of it, was to be the manager for the abandoned prostitute his daughter. And then, there was the jest again, my kind forgiving virtuous master would pardon me all my misdeeds. Yes, thank him for nothing, truly. And what pray are all these violent misdeeds? Why, they are for daring to adhere to the good lessons that were taught me, and not learning a new one that would have reversed all my former. For not being contented when I was run away with, in order to be ruined, but contriving, if my poor wits had been able, to get out of danger, and preserve myself honest. Then was he once jealous of poor John, though he knew John was his own creature, and helped to deceive me. Then was he outrageous against poor Parson Williams, and him has this good merciful master thrown into jail, and for what? Why, truly, for that being a divine and a good man, he had the fear of God before his eyes, and was willing to forego all his expectations of interest, and assist an oppressed poor creature. But, to be sure, I must be forward, bold, saucy, and what not, to dare to run away from certain ruin, and to strive to escape from an unjust confinement, and I must be married to the parson, nothing so sure. He would have had but a poor catch of me, had I consented, but he, and you too, know I did not want to marry anybody. I only want to go to my poor parents, and to have my own liberty, and not to be confined by such an unlawful restraint and which would not have been inflicted upon me, but only that I am a poor, destitute young body, and have no friend that is able to write me. So, Mrs. Duke, said I, here is my history in brief, and I am a very unhappy young creature, to be sure. And why am I so? Why, because my master sees something in my person that has taken his present fancy, and because I would not be undone. Why, therefore, to choose, I must and I shall be undone, and this is all the reason that can be given. She heard me run on all this time while I was undressing without any interruption, and I said, Well, I must go to the two closets, ever since an affair of the closet at the other house, though he is so far away. And I have a good mind to wake this poor maid. No, don't, said she, I charge you. I am very angry with her, and shall get no harm there, and if she wakes she may come to bed well enough, as long as there is a candle in the chimney. So I looked into the closet, and knelt down in my own, as I used to do, to say my prayers, and this with my underclothes in my hand, all undressed, and passed by the poor sleeping wench, as I thought in my return. But, oh, little did I think it was my wicked, wicked master, in a gown and petticoat of hers, and her apron over his face and shoulders. What meanness will not Lucifer make his votaries stoop to, to gain their abominable ends? Mrs. Jukes by this time was got into bed, on the farther side as she used to be, and to make room for the maid when she should awake, I got into the bed and lay close to her. And I said, Where are the keys? Though, said I, I am not so much afraid to-night. Here, said the wicked woman, put your arm under mine, and you shall find them about my wrists, as they used to be. So I did, and the abominable designer held my hand with her right hand, as my right arm was still under her left. In less than a quarter of an hour, I said, there's poor Nan awake, I hear her stir. Let us go to sleep, said she, and not mind her, she'll come to bed when she's quite awake. Poor soul, said I. I'll warrant she will have the headache finally to-morrow for this. Be silent, she said, and go to sleep. You keep me awake, and I never found you in so talkative a humour in my life. Don't chide me, said I. I will but say one thing more. Do you think Nan could hear me talk of my master's offers? No, no, said she. She was dead asleep. I'm glad of that, said I because I would not expose my master to his common servants, and I knew you were no stranger to his fine articles. Said she, I think they were fine articles, and you were bewitched you did not close with them, but let us go to sleep. So I was silent, and the pretended Nan, oh, wicked base villainous designer, what a plot, 
and what an unexpected plot was this, seemed to be awakening. And Mrs. Dukes, a borrowed creature, said, Come, Nan, what are you awake at last? Prithee come to bed, for Mrs. Pamela is in a talking fit, and won't go to sleep one while. At that the pretended she came to the bedside, and sitting down in the chair where the curtain hid her, began to undress. Said I, Poor Mrs. Anne, I warrant your head aches most sadly. How do you do? Says he, One word with you, Pamela, one word, hear me, but I must say one word to you. It is this. You see now you are in my power. You cannot get from me, nor help yourself. Yet have I not offered anything amiss to you? But if you resolve not to comply with my proposals, I will not lose this opportunity. If you do, I will leave you. Oh, sir, said I, leave me, leave me, but, and I will do anything I ought to do. Swear then to me, said he, that you will accept my proposals. With struggling, fright and terror, I fainted away quite, and did not come to myself soon, so that they both, from the cold sweats that I was in, thought me dying. And I remember no more than that, when with great difficulty they brought me to myself, she was sitting on one side of the bed, with her clothes on, and he on the other side with his, and in his gown and slippers. Your poor Pamela cannot answer for the liberties taken with her in her deplorable state of death. And when I saw them there, I sat up in my bed, without any regard to what appearance I made, and nothing about my neck, and he soothing me, with an aspect of pity and concern, I put my hand to his mouth and said, Oh, tell me, yet tell me not, what have I suffered in this distress? And I talked quite wild, and knew not what, for to be sure I was on the point of distraction. He most solemnly, and with bitter imprecation, vowed that he had not offered the least indecency, that he was frightened at the terrible manner I was taken with the fit, that he should desist from his attempt, and begged but to see me easy and quiet. And he would leave me directly, and go to his own bed. <gasps> then said I, take with you this most wicked woman, this foul Mrs. Jukes, as an earnest that I might believe you. And will you, sir, said the wicked wretch, for a fit or two, give up such an opportunity as this? I thought you had known the sex better. She is now, you see, quite well again. This I heard more she might say, but I fainted away once more at these words, and at his clasping his arm about me again. And when I came a little to myself, I saw him sit there, and the maid Nan holding a smelling bottle to my nose, and no Mrs. Jukes. He said, taking my hand, Now will I vow to you, my dear Pamela, that I will leave you the moment I see you better, and pacified. Here's Nan knows, and will tell you my concern for you. I vow to God I have not offered any indecency to you, and since I found Mrs. Jukes so offensive to you, I have sent her to the maid's bed, and the maid shall be with you to-night. And but promise me that you will compose yourself, and I will leave you. But, said I, will not Nan also hold my hand, and will she not let you come in again to me? He said, By heaven, I will not come in again to-night. Nan, undress yourself, go to bed, and do all you can to comfort the dear creature. And now, dear Pamela, said he, give me but your hand, and say you forgive me, and I will leave you to your repose. I held out my trembling hand, which he vouchsafed to kiss, and I said, God forgive you, as you have been just in my distress, and you will be just to what you promise. And he withdrew with a countenance of remorse, as I hoped, and she shut the doors, and at my request brought the keys to bed. This, my, my dear parents, was a most dreadful trial. I tremble still to think of it, and dare not recall all the horrid circumstances of it. I hope, as he assures me, he was not guilty of indecency, but have reason to bless God, who, by disabling me my faculties, empowered me to preserve my innocence, and when my strength would have signified nothing, magnified himself in my weakness. I was so weak all day on Monday that I could not get out of my bed. 
"'My master showed great tenderness for me, and I hope he is really sorry, "'and that this will be his last attempt, but he does not say so neither. "'He came in the morning as soon as he heard the door open, and I began to be fearful. "'He stopped short of the bed and said, "'Rather than give you apprehensions, I will, I will come no farther. "'I said, Your honour, sir, and, that, and your mercy is all I have to beg.' He sat himself on the side of the bed, and asked kindly how I did, begged me to be composed, said I still looked a little wildly, and I said, Pray, good sir, let me not see this infamous Mrs. Jukes. I doubt I cannot bear her sight. She shan't come near you all this day, if you'll promise to compose yourself. Then, sir, I will try. He pressed my hand very tenderly, and went out. What a change does this show, and may it be lasting! But, alas, he seems only to have altered his method of proceeding, and retains, I doubt, his wicked purpose. On Tuesday, about ten o'clock, when my master heard I was up, he sent for me down into the parlour. As soon as he saw me, he said, Come nearer to me, Pamela. I did so, and he took my hand, and said, You begin to look well again, I am glad of it. "'You little slut, how you did frighten me on the Sunday night!' "'Sir,' said I, "'pray name not that night, and my eyes overflowed at the remembrance, "'and I turned my head aside. "'Said he, "'Place some little confidence in me. "'I know what those charming eyes mean, "'and you shall not need to explain yourself, "'for I do assure you that as soon as I saw you change, "'and a cold sweat bedew your pretty face, and you fainted away, I quitted the bed, and Mrs. Jukes did so too. And I put on my gown, and she fetched her smelling-bottle, and we both did all we could to restore you. And my passion for you was all swallowed up in the concern I had for your recovery, for I thought I never saw a fit so strong and violent in my life, and feared we should not bring you to life again. For what I saw you in once before was nothing to it, this, said he, might be my folly, and my unacquaintedness with what passion your sex can show when they are in earnest. But this I repeat to you, that your mind may be entirely comforted. Whatever I offered to you was before you fainted away, and that, I am sure, was innocent. Sir, said I, that was very bad, and it was too plain you had the worst designs. When, said he, I tell you the truth in one instance, you may believe me in the other. I know not, I declare, beyond this lovely bosom your sex, but that I did intend what you call the worst is most certain. Although I would not too much alarm you now, I could curse my weakness and my folly, which makes me own that I love you beyond all your sex, and cannot live without you. But if I am master of myself and my own resolution, I will not attempt to force you to do anything again. Sir, said I, you may easily keep your resolution, if you'll send me out of your way to my poor parents. That is all I beg. Tis folly to talk of it, said he. You must not, shall not go. And if I could be assured you were not attempted, you should have better usage, and your confinement should be made easier to you. But to what end, sir, am I to stay, said I? You yourself seem not sure you can keep your own present good resolutions. "'And do you think if I were to stay, when I could get away and be safe, "'it would not look as if either I confided too much in my own strength, "'or would tempt my ruin? "'And if I were not in earnest to wish myself safe and out of danger? "'And then how long am I to stay? "'And to what purpose? "'And at what right must I appear to the world? "'Would that not censure me, though I might be innocent?' and you will allow sir that if there be anything valuable or exemplary in a good name or fair reputation one must not despise the world's censure if one can avoid it well said he i sent not for you on this account just now but for two reasons the first is that you promise me that for a fortnight to come you will not offer to go away without my express content and this i expect for your own sake that I might give you a little more liberty. And the second is, that you will see and forgive Mrs. Jukes, 
she takes on much, and thinks that as all her fault was her obedience to me, it would be very hard to sacrifice her, as she calls it, to your resentment. As to the first, said I, it is a hard injunction, for the reasons I have mentioned. And as to the second, considering her vile, unwomanly wickedness, and her endeavours you to instigate you more to ruin me, when your returning goodness seemed to have some compassion upon me, it is still harder. But to show my obedience to your commands, for you know, my dear parents, I might as well make a merit of my compliance, when my refusal would stand me in no stead, I will consent to both, and to everything else that you shall be pleased to enjoin, which I can do with innocence. That's my good girl, said he, and kissed me, this is quite prudent, and shows me that you don't take insolent advantage of my faith for you, and will perhaps stand you in more stead than you are aware of. So he rang the bell, and said, Call down Mrs. Jukes. She came down, and he took my hand and put it into hers, and said, Mrs. Jukes, I am obliged to you for all your diligence and fidelity to me. But Pamela, I must own, is not because the service I employed you in was not so very obliging to her as I could have wished she would have thought it. And you were not to favour her, but obey me. But yet I'll assure you, at the very first word, she has at once obliged me by consenting to be friends with you, and if she gives me no great cause, I shall not, perhaps, put you on such disagreeable service again. Now, therefore, be you once more bedfellows and boardfellows, as I may say, for some days longer, and see that Pamela sends no letters nor messages out of the house, nor keeps a correspondence unknown to me, especially with that Williams. And as for the rest, show the dear girl all the respect that is due to one I must love, if she will deserve it, as I hope she will yet, and let her be under no unnecessary or harsh restraints. But your watchful care is not, however, to cease, and remember that you are not to disoblige me to oblige her, and that I will not, cannot, yet part with her. Mrs. Jukes looked very sullen, as if she would be glad still to do me a good turn, if it lay in her power. I took courage, then, to drop a word or two for poor Mr. Williams, but he was angry with me for it, and said he could not endure to hear his name in my mouth so I was forced to have done for that time. All this time my papers, that I buried under the rose-bush, lay there still, and I begged for leave to send a letter to you. So I should, he said, if he might read it first, but this did not answer my design, and yet I would have sent you such a letter as he might see, if I had been sure my danger was over. But that I cannot, for he now seems to take another method, and what I am more afraid of, because, maybe, he may watch an opportunity, and join force with her on occasion, when I am least prepared. For now he seems to abound with kindness, and talks of love without reserve, and makes nothing of allowing himself in the liberty of kissing me, which he calls innocent, but which I do not like, and especially in the manner he does it. But for the master to do it at all to a servant has meaning too much in it, not to alarm an honest body. Wednesday morning. I find I am watched and suspected still very close, and I wish I was with you, but that must not be, it seems, this fortnight. I don't like this fortnight, and it will be a tedious and dangerous one to me, I doubt. My master just now sent for me to take a walk with him in the garden but I like him not at all, nor his ways, for he would have, all the way, his arm about my waist, and said abundance of fond things to me, enough to make me proud, if his design had not been apparent. After walking about, he led me into a little alcove, on the farthest part of the garden, and really made me afraid of myself, for he began to be very teasing, and made me sit on his knee, and was so often kissing me that I said, "'Sir, I don't like to be here at all, I assure you. "'Indeed, you make me afraid.' "'And what made me the more so was what he once said to Mrs. Jukes, "'and did not think I heard him, "'and which, although almost uppermost with me, "'I did not mention before, "'because I did not know how to bring it in, in my writing. "'She, I suppose, had been encouraging him in his wickedness, 
for it was before the last dreadful trial, and I only heard what he answered. Said he, I will try once more, but I have begun wrong, for I see terror does but add to her frost. But she is a charming girl, and may be thawed by kindness, and I should have melted her by love, instead of freezing her by fear. Is he not a wicked sad man for this? To be sure I blush while I write it. But I trust that dear God, who has delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear, that is, he and Mrs. Duke's violences, will soon deliver me from this Philistine, that I may not defy the commands of the living God. But, as I was saying, this expression coming into my thoughts, I was of opinion I could not be too much on my guard at all times, more especially when he took such liberties, for he professed honour all the time with his mouth, while his actions did not correspond. I begged and prayed he would let me go, and had I not appeared quite regardless of all he said, and resolved not to stay if I could help it, I know not how far he would have proceeded, for I was forced to fall down upon my knees. At last he walked out with me, still bragging of his honour and his love. "'Yes, yes, sir,' said I, "'your honour is to destroy mine, and your love is to ruin me. I see it too plainly.' "'But, indeed, I will not talk with you, sir,' said I, any more. "'Do you know,' said he, "'whom you talk to and where you are?' "'You may believe I had reason to think him not so decent as he should be. "'For I said, "'As to where I am, sir, I know it too well, "'and that I have no creature to befriend me, "'and as to whom I talk to, sir, let me ask you, "'what would you have me answer?' "'Why, tell me,' said he, "'what answer you would make?' "'It will only make you angry,' said I, "'and so I shall fare worse, if possible. "'I won't be angry,' said he. "'Why then, sir,' said I, "'you cannot be my late good lady's son, "'for she loved me and taught me virtue. "'You cannot then be my master, "'for no master demeans himself so to his poor servant.' He put his arms round me and his other hand on my neck, which made me more angry and bold, and he said, "'What then am I?' "'Why,' said I, struggling from him and in great passion, "'to be sure you are Lucifer himself in the shape of my dear master, or you could not use me thus.' "'These are two great liberties,' said he, in anger, "'and I desire that you will not repeat them for your own sake. "'For if you have no decency towards me, I'll have none toward you.' I was running from him, and he said, "'Come back when I bid you.' So, knowing every place was alike dangerous to me, and I had nobody to run to, I came back at his call. And seeing him look so displeased, I held my hands together and wept, and said, "'Pray, sir, forgive me.' "'No,' said he, "'rather say, "'Pray, Lucifer, forgive me. "'And now, since you take me for the devil, "'how can you expect any good from me?' "'How rather can you expect anything but the worst treatment from me? "'You have given me a character, Pamela, "'and blame me not that I act up to it. "'Sir,' said I, "'let me beg you to forgive me. "'I am really sorry for my boldness, "'but indeed you don't use me like a gentleman, "'and how can I express my resentment if I mince the matter "'while you are so indecent?' "'Precise fool,' said he, "'what indecencies have I offered you?' I was bewitched I had not gone through my purpose last Sunday night, and then your licentious tongue had not given the worst name to little puny freedoms that show my love and my folly at the same time. But be gone, said he, taking my hand and tossing it from him, and learn another conduct and more wit, and I will lay aside my foolish regard for you and assert myself. Be gone, said he again with a haughty air. "'Indeed, sir,' said I, "'I cannot go till you pardon me, "'which I beg on my bended knees. "'I am truly sorry for my boldness. "'But I see how you go on. "'You creep by little and little upon me, "'and now soothe me and now threaten me, "'and if I should forbear to show my resentment "'when you offer incivilities to me, "'would that not be to be lost by degrees? "'Would it not show that I could bear anything from you?' "'if I did not express all the indignation I could express "'at the first approaches you make to what I dread? "'And have you not as good as avowed my ruin? 
"'And have you all once made me hope you will quit your purposes against me? "'How then, sir, can I act? "'But by showing my abhorrence for every step that makes towards my undoing. "'And what is left to me but words? "'And can these words be other than such strong ones "'as shall show the detestation for which, from the bottom of my heart, "'I have for every attempt upon my virtue? "'Judge for me, sir, and pardon me.' "'Pardon you,' said he, "'what, when you don't repent? "'When you have the boldness to justify yourself in your fault? "'Why don't you say you will never again offend me?' "'I will endeavour, sir,' said I, "'always to preserve that decency towards you which becomes me. "'But really, sir, I must beg your excuse for saying "'that when you forget what belongs to decency in your actions, "'and when words are all that are left me "'to show my resentment of such actions,' I will not promise to forbear the strongest expressions that my distressed mind shall suggest to me, nor shall your angriest frowns deter me when my honesty is in question. What then, said he, do you beg pardon for? Where is the promise of amendment for which I shall forgive you? Indeed, sir, said I, I own that it must absolutely depend on your usage of me. "'for I will bear anything you can inflict upon me with patience, "'even to the laying down of my life, "'to show my obedience to you in other cases. "'But I cannot be patient, I cannot be passive, "'when my virtue is at stake. "'It would be criminal in me if I was.' "'He said he never saw such a fool in his life, "'and he walked by the side of me some yards without saying a word, "'and seemed vexed and at last walked in, bidding me attend him in the garden after dinner. So, having a little time, I went up and wrote thus far. Wednesday night If, my dear parents, I am not destined more surely than ever for ruin, I have now more comfort before me than ever I knew, and am either nearer my misery or my happiness than ever I was. God protect me from the latter, if it be his blessed will, I have now such a scene to open to you that I know will alarm both your hopes and your fears as it does mine, and this it is. After my master had dined, he took a turn into the stables to look at his stud of horses, and when he came in he opened the parlour door where Mrs. Jukes and I sat at dinner, and at his entrance we both rose up, but he said, "'Sit still, sit still, and let me see how you eat your victuals, Pamela.' "'Oh,' said Mrs. Dukes, "'very poorly indeed, sir.' "'No,' said I, "'pretty well, sir, considering.' "'None of your considering,' said he, "'pretty face, and tapped me on the cheek. "'I blushed, but was glad he was so good-humoured, "'but I could not tell how to sit before him, "'nor to behave myself. "'So he said, "'I know, Pamela, you are a nice carver. "'My mother used to say so.' "'My lady, sir,' said I, "'was very good to me in everything.' "'and would always make me do the honours of her table for her "'when she was with her few select friends that she loved. "'Cut up,' said he, "'that chicken. "'I did so. "'Now,' said he, "'and took the knife and fork "'and put a wing upon my plate. "'Let me see you eat that.' "'Oh, sir,' said I, "'I have eaten a whole breast of chicken already "'and cannot eat so much.' "'But he said I must eat it for his sake, "'and he would teach me to eat heartily.' So I did eat it, but was much confused at his so kind and unusual freedom and condescension. And good lack, you cannot imagine how Mrs. Jukes looked and stared, and how respectable she seemed to me, and called me good madam, I'll assure you, urging me to take a little bit of tart. My master took two or three turns about the room, musing and thoughtful, as I had never before seen him, and at last went out, saying, "'I am going into the garden. "'You know, Pamela, what I said to you before dinner.' "'I rose and curtsied, saying, "'I would attend his honour, and he said, "'Do, good girl.' "'Well,' said Mrs. Jukes, "'I see how things will go. "'Oh, madam, as she called me again, "'I'm sure you to be our mistress, "'and then I know what will become of me. "'Ah, Mrs. Jukes,' said I, "'if I can but keep myself virtuous, "'tis the most of my ambition, "'and I hope no temptation shall make me otherwise.' Notwithstanding I had no reason to be pleased with his treatment of me before dinner, yet I made haste to attend him, 
and I found him walking by the side of that pond, which, for want of grace, and through a sinful despondence, had liked to have been so fatal to me, and the sight of which ever since has been a trouble and reproach to me. And it was by the side of this pond, and not far from the place where I had that dreadful conflict, that my present hopes, if I am not to be deceived again, began to dawn, which I presume to flatter myself with being a happy omen for me, as if God Almighty would show your poor sinful daughter how well I did to put my affiance to his goodness, and not to throw away myself, because my ruin seemed inevitable to my short-sighted apprehension. So, he was pleased to say, Well, Pamela, I am glad you have come of your own accord, as I may say. Give me your hand. I did so, and he looked at me very steadily, and pressing my hand all the time, at last said, I will now talk to you in a serious manner. You have a good deal of wit, a great deal of penetration, much beyond your years, and, as I thought, your opportunities. You are possessed of an open, frank, and generous mind, and a person so lovely that you excel all your sex in my eyes. All these accomplishments have engaged my affection so deeply that, as I have often said, I cannot live without you and I would divide with all my soul my estate with you to make you mine upon my own terms. These you have absolutely rejected, and that, though in saucy terms enough, yet in such a manner as to make me admire you all the more. Your pretty chit-chat to Mrs. Jukes the last Sunday night, so innocent and so full of beautiful simplicity, half disarmed my resolution before I approached your bed and I see you so watchful over your virtue, that, though I hope to find it otherwise, I cannot but confess my passion for you is increased by it. But now what shall I say farther, Pamela? I will make you, through a party, my adviser in this matter, though not perhaps my definite judge. You know I am not a very abandoned profligate. I have hitherto been guilty of no very enormous or vile actions. This of seizing you and confining you thus may perhaps be one of the worst, at least to persons of real innocent. Had I been utterly given up to my passions, I should before now have gratified them, and not have shown that remorse and compassion for you which have reprieved you more than once when absolutely in my power, and you are as inviolate a virgin as you were when you first came into my house. But what can I do? Consider the pride of my condition. I cannot endure the thought of marriage even with a person of equal or superior degree to myself, and have declined several proposals of that kind. How then, with the distance between us in the world's judgment, can I think of making you my wife? Yet I must have you. I cannot bear the thoughts of any other man supplanting me in your affections and the very apprehension of that has made me hate the name of Williams, and use him in a manner unworthy of my temper. Now, Pamela, judge for me, and since I have told you thus candidly my mind, and I see yours is big with some important meaning, by your eyes, your blushes, and that sweet confusion which I behold struggling in your bosom, tell me, with like openness and candour, what you think I ought to do, and what you would have me do. It is impossible for me to express the agitations of my mind on this unexpected declaration, so contrary to his former behaviour. His manner, too, had something so noble and so sincere, as I thought, that, alas for me, I found I had need of all my poor discretion to ward off the blow which this treatment gave to my most guarded thoughts. I threw myself at his feet, for I trembled and could hardly stand. "'Oh, sir,' said I, "'spare your poor servant's confusion. "'I oh, spare the poor Pamela.' "'Speak out,' said he, "'and tell me what I bid you. "'What do you think I ought to do?' "'I cannot say what you ought to do,' answered I. "'But I only beg that you will not ruin me. "'And if you think me virtuous, "'if you think me sincerely honest, "'let me go to my poor parents. "'I will vow to you that I will never suffer myself "'to be engaged without your approbation.' Still he insisted upon a more explicit answer to his question, of what I thought he ought to do. And I did, as to my poor thoughts of what you ought to do, 
I must needs say that indeed I think you ought to regard the world's opinion, and afford doing anything disgraceful to your birth and fortune. And therefore, if you really honour the poor Pamela with your respect, a little time, absence, and the conversation of worthier persons of my sex, will effectually enable you to overcome a regard so unworthy your condition. And this, good sir, is the best advice I can offer. "'Charming creature, lovely Pamela,' said he, with an ardour that was never before so agreeable to me. "'This generous manner is of a piece with all the rest of your conduct. "'But tell me still more explicitly what you would advise me to do in the case.' "'Oh, sir,' said I, "'take not advantage of my credulity, and in these my weak moments. "'But were I the first lady in the land instead of the poor abject Pamela?' I would, I could tell you, but I can say no more. Oh, dear father and mother, now I know you will indeed be concerned for me, for now I am for myself, and now I begin to be afraid I know too well the reason why all his hard trials of me and my black apprehensions would not let me hate him. But be assured still by God's grace that I shall do nothing unworthy of your Pamela, and if I find that he is still capable of deceiving me, and that this conduct is only put on to delude me more, I shall think nothing in this world so vile and so odious. And nothing, if he be not the worst of his kind, as he says, and I hope he is not, so desperately guileful as the heart of man. He generously said, I will spare your confusion, Pamela, but I hope I may promise myself that you can love me preferably to any other man and that no one in the world has any share in your affections. For I am very jealous of what I love, and if I thought you had a secret whispering in your soul that had not come up to a wish for any other man breathing, I should not forgive myself to persist in my affection for you, nor you if you did not frankly acquaint me with it. As I still continued on my knees on the grass border by the pond side, he sat himself down on the grass by me, and took me in his arms. "'Why hesitate, my dear Pamela?' said he. "'Can you not answer me with truth, as I wish? "'If you cannot, speak, and I will forgive you.' "'Oh, good sir,' said I, "'it is not that, indeed it is not, "'but a frightful word or two that you said to Mrs. Jukes "'when you thought I was not in hearing comes across my mind, "'and makes me dread that I am more danger than I ever was in my life.' "'You have never found me a common liar,' said he, too fearful and foolish Pamela. Nor will I answer how long I may hold in my present mind, for my pride struggles hard within me, I'll assure you, and if you doubt me I have no obligation to your confidence or opinion. But at present I am really sincere in what I say, and I expect you will be so too, and answer directly my question. I find, sir, said I, I know not myself, and your question is of such a nature that I only want to tell you what I heard, and to have your kind answer to it, or else what I have to say to your question may pave the way to my ruin and show a weakness that I did not believe was in me. Well, said he, you may say what you have overheard, for in not answering me directly you put my soul upon the rack, and half the trouble I have had with you would have brought to my arms one of the finest ladies in England. "'Oh, sir,' said I, "'my virtue was as dear to me as if I were of the highest quality, "'and my doubts, for which you know I have had too much reason, "'have made me troublesome. "'But now, sir, I will tell you what I heard, "'which has given me such great uneasiness. "'You talked to Mrs. Jukes of having begun wrong with me "'in trying to subdue me with terror and a frost and such like. "'You remember it well?' and that you would, for the future, change your conduct, and try to melt me, that was your word, by kindness. I fear not, sir, the grace of God supporting me, that any acts of kindness would make me forget what I owe to my virtue. But, sir, I may, I find, be made more miserable by such acts than by terror, because my nature is too frank or open to make me wish to be ungrateful. And if I should be taught a lesson I never yet learnt, with what regret should I descend to the grave, to think that I could not hate my undoer, and that at the last great day I must stand up as an accuser of the poor unhappy soul that I could wish it in my power to save? 
"'Exalted girl,' said he, "'what a thought is that! "'Why now, Pamela, you excel yourself. "'You have given me a hint that will hold me long. "'But, sweet creature,' said he, "'tell me what is this lesson which you never yet learnt "'and which you are so afraid of learning?' "'If, sir,' so, said I, "'you will again generously spare my confusion, "'I need not speak it. "'But this I will say, "'in answer to the question you seem most solicitous about, "'that I know not the man breathing "'that I would wish to be married to, "'or had ever thought of with such an idea. "'I had brought my mind so to love poverty "'that I hoped for nothing but to return "'to the best, though the poorest, of parents, "'and to employ myself in serving God and comforting them.' "'And you know not, sir, how you disappointed those hopes "'and my proposed honest pleasures when you sent me hither.' "'Well, then,' said he, "'I may promise myself that neither the parson nor any other man "'is any the least secret motive to your steadfast refusal of my offers.' "'Indeed, sir,' said I, "'you may. "'And as you are pleased to ask, I answer "'that I have not the least shadow of wish or thought for any man living.' But, said he, for I am foolishly jealous, and yet it shows my fondness for you, have you not encouraged Williams to think you will have him? Indeed, sir, I have not. But the very contrary. And would you not have had him, said he, if you had got away by his means? I had resolved, sir, said I, in my mind, otherwise. And he knew it. And the poor man, I, I charge you, said he, say not a word in his favour. "'You will excite a whirlwind in my soul if you name him with kindness, "'and then you'll be borne away with the tempest.' "'Sir,' said I, "'I have done.' "'Nay,' said he, "'but do not have done. Let me know the whole. "'If you have any regard for him, speak out, "'for it would end fearfully for you, for me, and for him, "'if I found that you disguised any secret of your soul from me "'in this nice particular.' "'Sir,' said I, "'if I have ever given you cause to think me sincere, "'say then,' said he, interrupting me with great vehemence, "'and taking both my hands between his, "'say that you now, in the presence of God, "'declare that you have not any the most hidden regard "'for Williams or any other man.' "'Sir,' said I, "'I do. "'As God shall bless me and preserve my innocence, I have not.' "'Well,' said he, "'I will believe you, Pamela.' "'and in time, perhaps, I may better bear that man's name. "'And if I am convinced that you are not prepossessed, "'my vanity makes me assured "'that I need not fear a place in your esteem "'equal, if not preferable, to any man in England. "'But yet it stings my pride to the quick "'that you were so easily bought "'and such a short acquaintance "'to run away with that college novice. "'Oh, good sir,' said I, "'may I be heard one thing?' "'and though I bring upon me your highest indignation, "'I will tell you perhaps the unnecessary and imprudent, "'but yet the whole truth. "'My honesty, I am poor and lowly, "'and am not entitled to call it honour, was in danger. "'I saw no means of securing myself from your avowed attempts. "'You had showed you were not stick at little matters, "'and from what, sir, could any body have thought of my sincerity, "'in preferring that to all other considerations?' "'If I had not escaped from these dangers, "'if I could have found any way for it, "'I am not going to say anything for him, "'but indeed, sir, I was the cause of putting him "'upon assisting me in my escape. "'I got him to acquaint me what gentry there were "'in the neighbourhood that I might fly to, "'and prevailed upon him, "'don't frown at me, good sir, for I must tell you the whole truth, "'to apply to one Lady Jones, to Lady Downford, "'and he was so good as to apply to Mr. Peters, the minister.' "'but they all refused me. "'And then it was he let me know "'that there was no honourable way but marriage. "'That I declined, and he agreed to assist me for God's sake. "'Now,' said he, "'you are going.' "'I boldly put my hand before his mouth, "'hardly knowing the liberty I took. "'Pray, sir,' said I, "'don't be angry. "'I have just done, I would only say, "'that rather than have stayed to be ruined, "'I would have thrown myself upon the poorest beggar "'that ever the world saw, if I thought him honest. "'And I hope, when you duly weigh all matters, "'you will forgive me, "'and not think me so bold and so forward "'as you have been pleased to call me.' 
well said he even in this your last speech let me tell you shows more your honesty of heart than your prudence you have not over much pleased me but i must love you and that vexes me not a little but tell me pamela for now the former question recurs since you so much prize your honour and your virtue since all attempts against that are so odious to you and since i have avowedly made several of these attempts do you think it possible for you to love me preferably to any other of my sex ah sir said i and here my doubt recurs that you may thus graciously use me to take advantage of my credulity still perverse and doubting said he cannot you take me as i am at present and that i have told you is sincere and undesigning whatever i may be hereafter ah sir replied i what can i say i have already said too much if this dreadful hereafter should take place don't bid me say how well i can and then my face glowing as the fire i all abashed leaned upon his shoulder to hide my confusion he clasped me to him with great ardour and said hide your dear face in my bosom my beloved pamela your innocent freedoms charm me but then say how well what if you will be good said i to your poor servant and spare her i cannot say too much but if not i am doubly undone undone indeed said he i hope my present temper will hold for i tell you frankly that i have known in this agreeable hour more sincere pleasure than i have experienced in all the guilty tumults that my desiring soul pelled me into in the hopes of possessing you on my own terms and pamela you must pray for the continuance of this temper and i hope your prayers will get the better of my temptations this sweet goodness overpowered all my reserves i threw myself at his feet and embraced his knees what pleasure sir you give me at these gracious words is not lent your servants to express i shall be too much rewarded for all my sufferings if this goodness hold god grant that it may for your own soul's sake as well as mine and oh how happy should i be if he stopped me and said but my dear girl what must we do about the world and the world's censure indeed i cannot marry now was i again struck all of a heap however soon recollecting myself sir said i i have not the presumption to hope such an honour if i may be permitted to return in peace and safety to my poor parents to pray for you there it is all i present request this sir after all my apprehensions and dangers will be a great pleasure to me and if i know my own poor heart i shall wish you happy in a lady of suitable degree and rejoice most sincerely in every circumstance that shall make for the happiness of my late good lady's most beloved son well said he this conversation pamela has gone further than i intended you need not be afraid at this rate of trusting yourself with me but it is i that ought to be doubtful of myself when i am with you but before i say anything further on this subject i will take my proud heart to task until then let everything be as if this conversation had never passed only let me tell you that the more confidence you place in me the more you'll oblige me but your doubts will only beget cause of doubts and with this ambiguous saying he saluted me with a more formal manner if i may so say than before and lent me his hand and so we walked toward the house side by side him seemingly very thoughtful and pensive as if he had already repented him of his goodness what shall i do what steps take if all this be designing oh the perplexities of these cruel doubtings to be sure if he be false as i may call it i have gone too far much too far i am ready on the apprehension of this to bite my forward tongue or rather to beat my more forward heart the dictator to that poor machine for what i have said but sure at least he must be sincere for the time he could not be so practised a dissembler if he could oh desperately wicked is the heart of man and where could he learn all these barbarous arts if so it must be native surely to the sex 
but silent be my rash censuring be hushed you stir on me tumults of my disturbed mind for have i not a father who is a man a man who knows no guile who would do no wrong who would not deceive or oppress to gain a kingdom how then can i think it is native to the sex and i must also hope my good lady's son cannot be the worst of men if he is hard the lot of the excellent woman that bore him but much harder the hap of your poor pamela who has fallen into such hands but yet i will trust in god and hope the best and so lay down my tired pen for this time end of section fifteen